This is the Ambassador Bridge, one of 20 such structures connecting Canada to the good old US of A. It's a tribute to private enterprise in the face of bureaucratic bungling and incompetence. It's essentially a suspension bridge with a central span of 560 meters, or for our southern friends, 336.363 North American refrigerators long. Built out of roughly 19,000 tons of steel and with a deck height of 46 meters over the Detroit River, the Ambassador Bridge is the busiest crossing on the Canada-US border, with over 10,000 commercial vehicles crossing on any given weekday, all the while contributing its fair share to greenhouse gases that we've all come to know and love. It's also estimated to be the main transit point for one quarter of the trade between the two countries, valued at an eye-watering $100 billion per year. And depending on what you drive, the toll to cross it will set you back somewhere between 9 to 85 bucks US a pop, not including something that they call the axle charge. The year was 1927. Charles Lucky Lindy Lindbergh decided he needed to try Parisian cuisine and took off for Europe in what was essentially a flying gas can. Television's first image was transmitted by some guy named Farnsworth, and a once exiled vodka addled Russian by the last name of Stalin was busy consolidating his power over the unwashed masses. It was also the heady days of the Roaring Twenties, an era marked by prosperity, bootleggers, raccoon coats, and bathtub gin. People in America had a yen for travel, and thought that hanging out in the Great White North would be an excellent idea. Coincidentally, politicians proposed building bridges for that very purpose back as far as 1873, but true to their form, fought about the who, what, where, and what not regarding various projects, and got as far as, well, nowhere. Quel surprise, mon cher frere. Frustrated with the lack of progress from their various elected officials, the Michigan Central Railway Company simply built themselves a tunnel under the Detroit River and told the politicians to go fly a kite. They would have told them to jump into the Detroit River, but the simple lack of available bridge work made this a logistical impossibility. Because neither the governments of Ontario or Michigan wanted to finance a river crossing, Michigan automakers decided to take the initiative and build themselves a bridge. However, the project soon ran into issues when a Toronto financier embezzled the money and ran away with it, eh? Eventually, the consortium got their copex together and they got to work. Chosen location? Detroit, Michigan, and a small sleepy town in Kanakistan called Sandwich. I can't make this up, really. Sadly, it wasn't named after the Earl of Sandwich, who famously pioneered the technological innovation of marrying meat, cheese, and bread together but rather a place not really known for, well, anything in particular. However, thanks to urban sprawl, it eventually became a part of the City of Roses, otherwise known as Windsor, Ontario. Fast forward to the year 1929. Wall Street finally met its maker, an influenza pandemic stalked the globe, the Academy Awards began its dubious tradition of honoring its own in what is essentially a mutual admiration society, and Henry Ford's team of automotive industrialists finally finished their bridge. The cost? $23.5 million. Although it was known as the Detroit River Bridge during its construction, the gentleman behind financing the project declined naming it after himself, instead opting for its current name as he felt it was a symbol of the peace between the United States and Canada. Ergo, the ambassador it was to be. Unfortunately for the budding bridge-building business barons, the Great Depression put an end to the idea of lucrative crossing revenues, and the company went bankrupt in the 1930s. As a result, it became a publicly traded entity, leading to the heady days where any Joe Schmo or Sam Sixpack could be a partial owner of this outfit. And by the end of the 1970s, a decade dominated by brown corduroy pants and inventive music by the chemically inspired group named after type of bug from the order of Coleoptera, the Detroit International Bridge Company was 25% owned by one Mr. Warren Buffett Esquire. At the time, the shares were worth some 20 US smackers each, so a gentleman by the name of Matty Maroon, local trucking magnate and aspiring monopolist, decided to buy Mr. Buffett out at the price of 24 clams apiece, a cool 20% premium. Once the deal was done, Matty bought out the rest of the smaller share owners and Presto was sole proprietor of his own river crossing conglomerate. So long, Sam and Joe. Total cost? 
30 million dollars, which given the estimated value of between 1.5 to 3 billion dollars in today's money, was a true steal of a deal. And if you have a chance to visit, on both sides of the border you will be met by parkland, sculptures, walkways and spots where you can actually attempt to catch some fish, or maybe even a unique disease that makes the waters of the Detroit River its home and hideout. Imagine the TikToks you could do with that. The varied ecological features aside, you'll also be able to admire the bridge from various angles and even marvel at its gothic and art deco fusion inspired elements. As always, thanks for watching. Oh, and stay out of the drink. You'll thank me later.